Perfect. And we are live. I want to thank everyone for tuning in to a very special edition of Off the Record on the People's Podcast this evening. We have a wonderful guest with us tonight, one who is going to give us some amazing information as well as inspiration, and that is none other than the legendary Dr. Abdul Ali Muhammad, sir. <laughs> Assalamu alaikum, sir. Wa alaikum salam. Now, who's this legendary Dr. Ali? <laughs> I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> yes, sir. I, um, we here at the People's Podcast and, and with my family as well, are uh, very respectful and honored the work that you put in to help establish Islam here in North America, sir. We thank a lot for you and your family, and we are ready to hear from you, sir. Um, <laughs> Uh, my uncle, my uncle, Minister Jamil, says, uh, Assalamu alaikum, alaikum salam, sir. And uh, my sister Naima sends the greetings as well. Thank you all for watching. Okay, so we were getting a history lesson. We have a lot of great talking points for you all today. But uh, Dr. Aline was giving me some great history before we went live about, <laughs> about let's, let's start with you, sir, about you coming into the ministry class. How did that come about, sir? Oh, my goodness, my goodness, my goodness. See, that's... See, now that, that's quite a story, you see, yes, and, and I'm going to tell the good and the bad of it, you know, yes, but it had a happy ending, you know, because here I am. Um, but, you know, the beginning of any good minister back in those days was um, pushing the program, you know, selling the paper. That was the number one program. Yes, sir. And, of course, <clears throat> along with that, you were studying the teachings of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad under other ministers, mm. and they were your examples. So I put a post recently on my Telegram. That's how people can follow me on Telegram, Dr. Alim on Telegram. Yes, sir. Uh, my two mentors uh, in Cincinnati, and your uncle Jamil knows who I'm talking about, David Bacha. Mm. He was the minister of mosque number five in Cincinnati. That's where I came in the nation. I was actually in Dayton, Ohio. I was a college student uh, attending college at Antioch College in Yellow Springs, Ohio. That was right down the road from Central State University where Sister Ava was a student at the yes, time. Sir. She and her sister. That's where I met a brother from New York from mosque number seven, brother Alton X. Patterson. Mm -hmm. And he was like the student leader at Central State University. Mm -hmm. And he brought Minister Farrakhan into the campus in 1968. You see, and mm -hmm. so there was a turmoil going on on the campus. So uh, David Bacha was my minister as I came into the nation. And so I give him the credit for teaching me basic Islam and making me a Muslim. Mm -hmm. um, now, when I went to medical school in Cleveland, I was under Minister Theodore Hamza. Uh, and Minister Hamza was the one that actually brought me into the ministry class. Now, the story behind that, the story behind that, I was a medical student and I was, I was on a, what they call a full scholarship. But what that actually boiled down to, <laughs> I was living on $35 a week. Mm. You know, that was that was my budget, $35 a week. And then I had to pay $7.60 a week uh, charity. Mm. So one Wednesday night, I came in, I paid my $7.60 charity. Uh, and then the my lieutenant said uh, that the, that well, someone told me my lieutenant wanted to meet with me. So I went into the lieutenant's office and all the lieutenants were in there. And so they wanted to know how come I was so slim on my charity. And I explained to them, well, I'm, I'm a medical student. I don't, I can't work. I'm, I get $35 a week. That's what I live on. And I give $7 and whatever. That's all I got. So to make a long story short, they were not satisfied with my answer. Mm. So they were, you know, well, <laughs> what you doing? spending all your time, you know, getting that devil's education. We don't need no doctors. We're Muslim. We don't need no doctors. Hey, then one of the lieutenants, he pulled out a big wad of money. Yeah, I ain't going to no devil's school, brother. I mm -hmm. got money. How come you ain't got no money going to the devil's school? 
And so they were getting ready to knock me up, brother, long story short. Uh, and right at that critical moment when I was bracing myself to defend myself, a knock came on the door and it was brother Paul. Uh, brother Paul was the assistant secretary of Moss number 18 in Cleveland, Ohio. Mm -hmm. And he was just a little short brother, little frail looking brother uh, with glasses on, you know, the typical secretary looking brother. <laughs> you know? yes, yes, and these big old tough lieutenants. What, what you want, brother Paul? <laughs> and he said, oh, the minister wants to see him. See who? And he pointed at, at me. The minister mm -hmm. wants to see him. Mm -hmm. And so he took me out of that near clash over to Minister Theodore Hamza's office. And Minister Th Theodore told me, he didn't have his holy name at that time, he was just Minister Theodore. He told me, just have a seat, brother. And now the auditorium was on the second floor. So when it was time for him to deliver the lecture, this was a Wednesday night, he went up the back stairs. He told me, come with him, just follow me, brother, and sat me down on the stage. Mm -hmm. And you should have seen the lieutenants when they saw me on the stage with Minister Theodore. <laughs> and so he gave the lecture. We went back downstairs to his office. And he said, now, brother, from now on, when you come to the mosque, you come directly to my office and take a seat, whether I'm here or not. Mm -hmm. and if I'm not here, Sister Mary, she was the actual secretary. She'll let you in my office. And so that's how I had to come to the mosque for about a month. And so every time I came to the mosque, I went into Minister Theodore's office. When it was time for the lecture, he would take me upstairs with him. And then one, one day he said, brother, do you think you could open up for about five minutes? <laughs> and I was shocked. That's, that was like, well, well, maybe, <laughs> you know, maybe. Yes, sir, yes, sir. <laughs> but, you know, and so I, I, I did, and I did very well. And before you knew it, I was doing 10 minutes, 15 minutes. And believe it or not, uh, I ended up being an assistant minister of one of the largest mosques at that time in the nation. Mosque number 18 was massive. Mm -hmm. I mean, a Sunday meeting was 800, 900, 1,000 people, you know? Uh, and, and so I was, the, I was the teacher on Wednesday evenings. So here, let, let, me, let me add one little tag to this story. See, when I joined the nation, um, um, my father, he flipped his lid. <laughs> like, I didn't send you to college to be no black Muslim. You know? So he cut me off and you know, we weren't on speaking terms for a while. You know, it was kind of rocky. Uh, but then when he saw me go to medical school under the guidance of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, he's had the second look, you know? So one time he came to visit me in Cleveland. And uh, so, um, I told him, I said, well, look, I have to go to a meeting. It's just going to take a few minutes and I'll just have you wait till I'm done. That's how I told it to him. I said, I'm going to just have you have a seat and then I'm, I have a meeting and I'll uh, come and get you when I'm done. So I took him to the mosque. He didn't know where he was going. <laughs> <laughs> I sat him in the front seat in the auditorium. I said, Daddy, I'll be right back. <laughs> and when I came back, I was on stage. They were introducing me, you know, to give the lecture. And I talked my heart out that night. I talked the teachings of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad because I was teaching to my father and I Crazy. wanted him to really understand. And so on the ride home after the meeting, I, I, he didn't say nothing. He didn't say nothing, you know? So I said, well, what, Daddy, what did you think? And so he looked at me, he said, damn. He said, I guess I must be a Muslim. <laughs> <laughs> All praise is due to Allah. Yes, yeah, sir. but that's, that's how I got into ministry. You see, I, it wasn't like I wanted to be a minister. I was trying to be a doctor, you mm. know? But the lieutenants, you know, they, they, were, they were rough back in that day, see? It's not like, see, the lieutenants nowadays, they're, they're real nice people now. <laughs> they're real nice. <laughs> if they weren't so nice, <laughs> if they thought you were out of line, I mean, you know, I mean, it was some discipline. You know, it really was. It really was. Yes, sir. Well, well Dr. Lincoln, uh, we, 
And thank you all. Some people are showing you love all across the country. Thank you for your comments and your questions. I'm going to come to them. Who may I have your parents' name so, so we can have this on file for history? Your mother and your father's name, sir. Well, my father's name was Maurice Peters, mm. and they called him Pete. Now you can look him up um, if you look up the history of civil rights leaders in York, Pennsylvania. Uh, he was the civil rights leader in York, Pennsylvania. Mm. <laughs> so I, I came up, you know, like an activist in my whole life. I mean, he was active in the in the NAACP, you know, you know everything. Every time they had police brutality, they would go get Pete, and Pete would be giving a speech and you know leading the march or something. And then my mother, uh, her name uh, Ruth Virginia Peters. Um, now she uh, she was like my father's um, silent partner. Mm. She hardly ever went out to any public rallies or events like that. But I noticed that they had like a partnership. Like my father would be out there, he would be rabble rousing and you know, getting the people all worked up and you know, fired up. Then he would come home and he would give a point by point report to my mother. Mm. And my mother, she'd just be sitting there, she'd be nodding her head. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Then she'd stop and say, now what did this one say? And what, what did that one say? And what did that one look like? What kind of expression was on her face? And she would analyze the whole thing. Then she mm. would tell him, now here's what, what you do the next time. And she would run it down to him. Mm -hmm. And then and my father, he would he would do just what my mother said. Yeah. And I said, well, wow, you know, my, my dad is really smart. He listens to my mother and my mother, she's even smarter than him because she's mm. telling him what to do. <laughs> so they had a good relationship. That's, that's what I'm saying. And so that's, I, you know, I, I really, later in life, I appreciated the value of that kind of relationship between a married couple, mm. you know? I mean, that was the way it was supposed to be. Yes, sir. All praises due to Allah and may Allah be pleased with both of your parents, sir. And people are showing you love all across the country. Uh, we have we have multiple questions for you, Dr. Aileen. Uh, I want to just go back to the comments. Malikum Salam, Sister Matula, my sister Miriam, people are showing you uh, love. And then Sister April, people saying, I said, Malikum, dear family. Uh, brother, you know, Minister Jamil saying, I mean, number, Mosque number 18, wow, interesting, Ohio Chronicles, beautiful. What advice would you give to the younger generation who are going into the ministry um, and learning how to defend the teachings of the Most Honorable Elijah Muhammad? Well, um, that's a very good question. And, you know, that would, <laughs> that would require, you know, a lecture in and of itself. But in okay. short, um, you have to learn the teachings. You have to understand what the teachings actually are. And that was the great value of the way I came into the nation because I was very skeptical of religion, as most people in society nowadays are. Uh, very, even people who call themselves Christians or call themselves Muslims, uh, they're actually religious skeptics. Uh, they don't put much reliance on God or religion as a way of life. Uh, they use God and religion more or less as labels, you know, to fit in certain groups in society. So I was like that, even to the degree I was I was one degree away from being an atheist mm -hmm. when I was in college, because I knew that what I had been taught in the church was a lie. And I thought that's all there was. But see, David Bachar, the minister that I was under, um, he explained thoroughly the teachings of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. When I saw, said to him, well, you, you know, I, I, that I, explain to me who and what God is. Well, he asked me, well, what do you think God is? He asked me. And I gave, you know, the spook God answer, the spook God answer. You know, mm -hmm. what, what you learn in church, what you learn in society about God. And so he said, young man, it's not so much that you disbelieve in God. It's just that nobody ever taught you about God. So why don't you have a seat? Because this was at a meeting and I had stood up to ask a question. He said, why don't you have a seat and let me explain to you who and what God is. Now, actually what he was teaching from the rostrum is what you find in message to the black man, the true knowledge of, of who and what God is. And so that's the starting point of being a minister in the nation of Islam. You cannot be a spook God believer. Mm -hmm. Now, when I found out 
that God was a man. See, that did it for me. I said, oh, oh, you talk, you're saying God is a man. And mm -hmm. man is a God. And David Bachel said, yes. And it always has been and always will be. Mm -hmm. So now, see, that's what got me interested in Islam. I said, and these people are not talking some spook God religion, some superstitious. It's not some personality cult. They talking about God is a man and man is a God and always have been. and can be proven in no limit of time. And then they started running it down to how that was actually true. And, I, and again, like I was a, a very intelligent uh, college student, you know, very skeptical, scientific in my thinking. And, and when I found out that Islam is mathematics and mathematics is Islam. Yes, sir. Oh my goodness, I was finished because I had been on the horns of a dilemma. See, I had come up in a spiritual family. So you ask about my parents. I never heard my, I never heard I never heard my parents argue. I never, you know, that damn that my father said when he heard the teachings, that's, that's as far as he ever went in cursing. Mm, mm. He would look over, he look over his shoulder before he said, damn. I never heard my mother curse. I came up in a family, you know, that was, we weren't overly religious, like getting the Holy Ghost but just good, solid people. I had good grandparents that were the same way. Yes, sir. So I was a good boy. See, I wasn't no goody, goody two shoes now. I'm not talking about that. But I had a respect for righteousness. I wanted to be right. I wanted to be good. I didn't want to be bad. I didn't get no satisfaction out of doing wrong. But we live in a world that's wrong. And so I'm trying to figure out how in the world can I be a, a righteous person in a wicked world? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So when I found out that Islam was mathematics and mathematics was Islam, see, that, that solved the problem of how you merge the, the spiritual with the material. Oh, oh, that all merged. Y'all got a teaching like that? Y'all got a teaching that merges the spiritual with the material? so that I can be a good person and successful at the same time? You mm -hmm. mean I, I can be rich without robbing and stealing and killing and exploiting some other people? Oh, I was interested in that, see? And so that solved a whole lot of problems for me as a young man. I can be upright, I can be righteous, and I can be, I can be strong and I can be rich, I can be prosperous, and plus all that, I'm God. <laughs> hey. Hey, how, how could you turn that down? See, mm -hmm. that's the, what I was looking at. How could you turn something like that down when they break it down to you like that? So now, now, now to get to, to the question, you know, about uh, being a minister. See, I, I got to be a minister by selling 900 papers a week. Mm -hmm. See, now, how do you sell 900 papers a week? Now, I'm not boasting because I was bringing up the rear. See, I, see, if you talk about them brothers down there in Cincinnati, Brother Elijah, Brother Kenneth, Brother William X and William 2X, <laughs> you know, <laughs> oh, they're, 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 those are the paper sellers now. See, Brother Aaron and them brothers down there, see, they were the paper sellers. See, I was mm -hmm. selling 900 bringing up the rear because I was in college. I was going to school. I was taking physics and chemistry and calculus and all the rest of it. And, and that's all I could sell was 900. So I couldn't keep up with the big mm. boys. So that's why I never got to be as much as a squad leader. Mm. I never mm. got to be a lieutenant. No, those brothers, they got to be lieutenants and captains and stuff because they was real soldiers. See, I was a, I was wearing big eye, big eyeglasses, you know, <laughs> trying to go to school, <laughs> trying to be a FOI, yes, know, sir. trying to support myself. I was actually working as a janitor, brother. Mm. I was a janitor. But the mm. point I'm saying is, in order to sell 900 Muhammad Speaks newspapers to uh, mentally dead, resistant, hard-headed, stiff-necked Negroes, you have to have some salesmanship skills. And so David Bachelet actually taught us a scientific salesmanship. Mm. And so we began to use scientific salesmanship principles on our people 
uh, in the sale and distribution of the Muhammad Speaks newspaper. So that's how we got Muhammad Speaks up to over a million copies per week, see, through scientific salesmanship. You see, that's what we were taught in FOI class, scientific salesmanship. Well, what scientific salesmanship actually translates out to is the way that you present the teachings of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad in about 15 seconds to a customer on the corner. So you got to make your sales pitch. You got to make your delivery just that, just that quick, just that quick, just that quick. You got 900 papers to sell. You see? So now, in order to do that, you have to begin to get the knowledge of self, not just as it's written down in a book, but the knowledge of it of self as it's walking around in the shopping mall on the, yes, on the street corner, you know, <laughs> behind the closed doors. See, how, how, how do you get a closed door to open? You know, you out there in the dark with a bundle of papers under your arms and it's cold and you're knocking and it's a Sunday night, you're knocking on somebody's door. How do you get the door to open? Mm -hmm. See, what's the open sesame secret? See, I found out. The only thing you have to say to, to get a Negro to open up the door at night, uh, even, even, even in bad weather, is all you have to do is say, Muhammad. Mm. You just say, Muhammad, and they open the door. <laughs> mm. Mm. And then you get a chance to make your pitch. But the point I'm making is this, that by the time that Minister Hamza in Cleveland invited me to open up for him and later, I became his assistant on Wednesdays, at least, because there were other assistant ministers there. There was Minister Henry. He was a bank manager. And then there was Minister LC. So there were three assistant ministers over, over the mosque there. Mm -hmm. So the reason that I was able to somehow manage to teach a decent subject is because I had met all of those people that were sitting out in the audience out on the street. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. When I looked out in the audience and I looked in the faces, it was the same people that you see out in the street. And they have the same objections, the same questions, the same ideas, the same mindset as the people out there in the street. So the problem that any minister would have today would be, oh, how, how much time have you been out on the street? See, have you been out on the street? Have you been in the community? Have you actually been face to face with the people? Have you looked into where they actually live? Have you smelled the urine from the couch? Have you seen the babies crawl, crawl, crawling around in the squalor on the floor? Have you had somebody put a gun in your face just by for offering them a paper? Has somebody gone to the back saying, I'll be right back uh, with some change, uh, uh, but I'm sorry, it's gonna be pennies. And you say, well, that's no problem, ma'am. Mm -hmm. Only thing mm -hmm. is, she comes back with pennies dripping in bacon fat. Mm -hmm. You see? So, so when you go through things like that, in an effort to get rid of your papers, <laughs> see, it depends on your attitude. See, there were brothers, to tell the truth, there were brothers who complained about the workload of being an FOI. They were complainers. They were slack talkers. They didn't last too long. But we got rid of them. You see, so the ones that were left were the ones that were ready for some hard work. That, that's what I was told when I joined the nation. He said, your acceptance of Islam is an acceptance of an invitation to hard work. Mm -hmm. And they weren't lying about that part. They weren't lying <laughs> about that part. It was some hard work. But look, after difficulty comes ease. Because I put in that kind of hard work in the street. It was so easy to get up in, in a rost on the rostrum in a nice fine suit, <laughs> you know, looking pretty and fine, you know, and you got your Bible and all and your Koran and everything, and you got complete control. And the FOI at the front door, they have checked everybody, no weapons, no danger whatsoever, ever. Everybody's on their best behavior. Everybody's looking good. Hey, and you got the best teachings in the world. Oh my goodness. How could you, how could you not be successful? How could you not? You see, so that's the key. You got to be among the people. You got to do the work of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad among the people and study them. See, that's the teaching. See, you, you got the book learning, or you should, the Bible and the Quran. Don't read too much of the Bible, though.
because you'll go crazy. Um, mm -hmm. And see, a message to the black man, the messenger tells you what part of the Bible that you can use. Mm -hmm. But don't get caught up in that swamp because you'll get poisoned by the creatures that are uh, crawling around in there. <laughs> yes. Excellent, excellent. Yes, sir, Dr. Lee, and people showing you love all across the country. Thank you all for everyone who to like, share, and subscribe to the People's Podcast. My brother Rashad is putting the fire emoji to the rain. The Senator Greetings. People just showing you love. Um, Mr. Jamil showing you love to Brother William X. Barry from Cincinnati. He brought him in the temple. Okay, we're getting a lot of great history. But Mark Anderson loves to see the doctor. Everybody saying, all praise to Allah. Powerful. Ain't no mystery God. Beautiful teaching. <laughs> yes, sir. Okay, great. My next question for you, sir, is I want to go back to the janitor uh, point. How did you go from being a janitor to to become a Dr. Alim that we saw on videos growing up and being on <laughs> traveling around the world and you know AIDS cures and all that stuff, but you were a janitor. How did you keep the motivation while you were being a janitor? Uh, well, see, see, it goes back to there's always a prior story, right? See, one of the things I was always known for, uh, even in the dead world, and then later on in the nation. They always said, Brother Maurice always got money. That's mm -hmm. what they used to say. Because I did, I always had money. Mm -hmm. Now, when I was in the dead world, before I came in the nation, the re one of the reasons I always had money was because I used to sell marijuana. Mm -hmm. So I always had money because that was a very popular business to be in. <laughs> now, it almost got me killed. <laughs> mm -hmm. that, that's another story. you know. But I always had money. And so then when I came in the nation uh, with Islam, uh, I always had money. You see, the teachings work. Islam worked. I got along with everybody. Everybody got along with me. I had good jobs. But then one time, see, it says that Allah would try you. So I had a good job. I was working for the city of Dayton, making good money as a college student. And, um, and I had an easy job. So I was getting paid for eight hours but I could get the job done in four. Mm. And then I would use the other four, I would go out and sell papers. So one afternoon, <laughs> I was out selling papers in front of the bank <laughs> that my supervisor came to the to cash his check. <laughs> mm, 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 mm. And he saw me out there selling papers, you know, and I got fired from my mm. good job, see? And I said, okay, I'll just get me another one. Now I almost got put out the nation. Mm. because that was a Friday. So when I went to the mosque and told the captain that I just got fired, he wanted to know why I got fired. I said, well, I was selling, I was, it was for a good reason, brother captain, I was selling papers. And when he found out that I was cheating the devil out of four hours of labor, he said, I ought to put you out of the nation. Mm. He said, but I'll just give you a warning. You know, if, if, if somebody's paying you for eight hours of work, then you give them eight hours of work and you don't steal time from them and try to give it to Muhammad. Muhammad does not want your stolen time. Mm. I said, ooh, okay, I thought I was going to get a slap, you know, a commendation, you know, almost got put out. Yes, sir. But then guess what happened, brother um, Joshua? I couldn't find another job. Mm. I couldn't find another job to save my life. I traveled all over that region. I was trying to get a job just as an intern at a hospital. I, I just wanted to have something to do in medicine. I, was, I could not get a job in Dayton, Ohio. I couldn't get a job in Cincinnati. Couldn't get a job in Louisville. Couldn't get a job in Columbus, Ohio. Couldn't get a job anywhere. And I, I can remember when I spent my last $20. I didn't know it was my last $20, but it was <laughs> for a long time, you see? And I didn't have nothing. And if I didn't have the FOI, because see, I, I couldn't even keep up my end of the rent. We were living in a FOI house. I couldn't even keep up my end of the rent. That's how poor, and they couldn't believe it. Brother Maurice always got money, but not now, I ain't have nothing. Mm -hmm. And so long story short, the only job I could get <laughs> was a janitor. Yes, sir. And so I was working evenings as a janitor uh, in a bank. And I came in there dressed like a janitor and I did a, I did a good job too. I was a good janitor. And, um, and, and 
you know, and so that's how I made it through college uh, and in, into medical school, you see. But the, the great day came uh, when I got accepted into medical school and I got a scholarship. And I remember I met my uh, supervisor. He was walking up the steps and I was walking down the steps. And he said, where are you going? I said, I'm going, I'm going to medical school. That's where I'm going. <laughs> And he was shocked because he just thought I was some old dumb Negro. That's what he mm. thought. Mm. Was some old dumb Negro pushing a broom, you know, pushing a mop. You see, but I wasn't proud. See, I mean, I was, I, hey, work is work. You know, you do honest work. That's how I was raised. You know, I'm, I'm not too proud. I'll be a janitor today if necessary. <laughs> What's wrong with being a janitor? Go ahead, Dr. And when I was growing up, I wanted to be a garbage man. That's actually what I wanted to be. Mm. Yeah, I wanted to be a garbage man because my father's best friend was a garbage man. They call them sanitation men to today. But yeah. back then they called them garbage men. And so Mr. Red was my father's best friend because Mr. Red and my father both played jazz guitar. So they used to get together and play jazz guitar. So when we went over to Mr. Red's house, when they would uh, practice, I would be down in Mr. Red's basement because, see, he was a garbage man. He was collecting stuff from all over town. <laughs> you know, telling, the Mr. Red had a Bowie knife in the basement. Mr. Mm -hmm. Red had violins. He had all kinds of stuff that people had thrown out. So I said, well, hey, if, if this is what you have to do to get all the good stuff, hey, I don't mind being a garbage man. <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> all right. Well, well, Dr. Ali, once again, people are showing you love all across the... Uh, uh, nation and across the country. We can't wait to put this on YouTube. <coughs> you sent me a very powerful video of uh, you with the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan and Gaddafi oh. doing Salat and you all were praying. Can you let me know what, let us know what was the service? I never saw that video before. What was the, what, what, where was that and what, what was the circumstances behind you all doing Salat with Muammar Gaddafi? Well, yeah, that was one of the times, one of the great, great occasions. Um, where I was blessed to be with the minister when he was meeting with Muammar Gaddafi. Mm -hmm. Now, I don't know where that video came from. Somebody mm -hmm. sent that to me. Mm -hmm. So I don't know where it came from or who took it. Uh, I can't remember exactly what year it was. If I had to guess, it was the year that Bill Clinton was elected president. Because okay. we made a trip uh, to Libya uh, right after he had been elected president. And so that meeting um, on that day took place. It was not in the video. You couldn't see it. But to the left of the video frame was Muammar Gaddafi's tent. He mm. didn't live in a house. He lived in a tent. And so that was somewhere out in the desert. I don't know where it was. They took us in these... They had a whole fleet of Mercedes Benz, you know, mm, mm, mm. <laughs> they would go flying across the desert. I don't know where we went to. It wasn't far from Tripoli. It wasn't that mm. far, but it was out in the middle of nowhere. And he had this, now when I say a tent, <laughs> it's not the kind of tent that you and I know. <laughs> no, this is like a palace tent. <laughs> yes, sir. Yes, sir. This is like the most finest tent that you ever saw in your life. And then they have all these Oriental carpets, you know, I get, uh, right, I guess right down on the sand, I guess, I guess. Mm -hmm. It sounds like you, I mean, it feels like you're walking on a carpet that's on top of, of the sand, mm -hmm. you know? And then they have all these big cushions and stuff built up and I mean, it's luxurious, you know, it really is. And so we sat in there and uh, had a meeting, you know, about something. I don't even remember what the meeting was about. Uh, but then you see a lot of places that we visited, especially with leaders like Gaddafi or say in Nigeria with uh, General Sani Abacha, who was the president of Nigeria at the time. And a lot of these leaders in different countries who were Muslims, one of the things that they always had, I should say one of the things, or one of the people that they always had on their staff was a sheikh, mm. a sheikh. So we were in a business meeting or discussion with Gaddafi and then bursting into the meeting is his shake. <laughs> it's prayer time. Mm. So it doesn't matter what's going on. Everything is dropped. Everybody goes and performs voodoo. 
And then we, we, I didn't know where we were going to make Salat. Next thing I know, we're out there, you know, where you saw in the video. Yes, sir. And there we are, you know, and Gaddafi was leading the prayer. Mm. Now, I mm. wasn't actually surprised to see him leading the prayer because the, the very first time that I went to Libya uh, was in 1989. And this was the 20th anniversary of the Libyan Jamahiriya revolution. And I was there with Brother Wali, the editor of the Final Call newspaper. Yes, sir. And uh, we arrived and it was on a Friday. We, I guess we got in late Thursday night or very early Friday morning. So when we woke up a little late that Friday in the hotel, uh, we turned on the TV to see what Libyan TV was like. Yes, sir. And it ended up being the time of Juma prayer. Mm. Guess who was leading the Juma prayer for the entire nation of Libya on television? Mm. Mm. Muammar Gaddafi. Wow, so wow. That was my introduction to Libya. That was my introduction to Muammar Gaddafi, that when you turn on the television, he's leading the entire nation in prayer. See? Mm. Yes, sir. Powerful. Okay, definitely. You've given us some great history, and people are uh, always um, and, and showing you, continue to show you love in the comments. Um, uh, Minister Jamil says, "May Allah be pleased with Brother Wali." I mean, uh, peace like Aline. People are saying, "You know, great to see you," um, and excellent. All right, we have a quick sixty-second commercial break for all of the sponsors of the People's Podcast, and when we come back, we have a lot of questions for Dr. Aline. We're just going to spend the time with him. Please let us know your comments. With uh, I mean, continue to let us know your questions and comments in the. Uh, comment section. Thank you, everyone, who every who likes, shares, and subscribes to the People's Podcast. One second, Dr. Lee, we coming right back. Quick 60 second commercial break. A camera and a drone. He does television and film editing. Please reach out to him if you need any of those services. Sister Miriam's ABC I Love Me children's book and coloring book, and now Spanish book. All three available on Amazon.com. Sister Naima's Stay On Point Dance Academy, LLC. She teaches ballet virtually to young girls all across the country, right here in the studios of Atlanta, Georgia. Brother Kenneth's bow tie maker extraordinaire. He'll ship you bow ties anywhere across the nation. Dr. Henry Carter's King Henry Turkey Legs, right here in Atlanta, Georgia. Brother Rashad Muhammad's COVID-19 disinfected cleaning services out of Chicago. Student Minister Sharif Muhammad's book, A Soldier in a Movement of Christ, available on adulsharif.com. And lastly, Brother Joshua Muhammad's book, Cleopatra, as well as No Father, No Excuse, both available on Amazon. All right, we're coming right back. Okay, waiting on Dr. Amin. Thank you to uh, Sister Sister Ria. Um, As-salamu alaykum, ma'am. Thank you very much for watching. Thank you very much, Sister Allison. Um, thank you, Sister Sean. Uh, thank you, everyone who's continued to watch. Dr. Aleem, you're getting love all across the country. And thank you for every anonymous I passion. love you back. <laughs> yeah. Yes, sir. Okay, speaking of... Okay, wait. Wait, wait. Yes, sir. All right, let me grab my water. Yes, sir. Dr. Aleem, will you ever write a book about your personal life and all of your, you know, chronicling, everything <laughs> you've been through. Well, that, that, that's a lie I've been telling for years and years that I'm gonna write a book. But no, <laughs> I, I am I am gonna write a book. <laughs> okay, yes, sir. I am, as a matter of fact, I have about 80 pages already written. Mm. And, um, and it's mostly gonna be like telling stories because that's really mm. what your life is all, all about. I used to, I used to be the most boring person in the world and I used to be fascinated by people who could tell stories. And now I find myself telling stories and people seem to be fascinated by the stories that I tell, but yes, really sir. they're just the stories of what happened to me in my life. Mm, you know, mm. I was just living life and this is what happened. <laughs> you know, so yes, um, now I, I, I need help. I, I really need help to write a book, um, you know, and I'm sure there's people out there who could help, help me, but, um, I think it's not only something that I, I should do, it's something that I must do. Mm, um, mm. Actually, um, I have a duty to do it. See, I have a duty to people of your generation and younger. 
uh, because you had no way of knowing or experiencing the things that I've experienced. You know, you, you, you know, it just wasn't possible. Yeah. And then one of these days, I'm going to drop off the planet like everybody else. You know, and so what? Should all of my life's experiences drop off the planet with me? Mm. No, no, no. So many. So there's, there's there's other people like me who should accept that responsibility. You know, to write down what you know from your point of view. Yes, sir. And and don't worry about whether somebody thinks you're right or wrong. Just tell the truth about what happened to you. Mm. You know, the lieutenants really were gonna beat me up. They really were. <laughs> You know, I can't, I can't lie about it. They really were going to beat me up, you know, and I wouldn't have been the first one, you see. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. But, but, uh, but again, that's what, that's what happened. And as a result of that, say, negative thing happening, look, look at the positive that came out of it. I never would have been in the ministry if I, if I had not been threatened like that. Mm, mm. <laughs> Understand? Yes, yeah, yeah, so I'll, 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 I'll be more conscientious and uh, and and do do that but but now let me just add one other thing see we live in a different age books are always important if you go to the library of congress and you look up uh, at the dome in the library of congress uh they have sayings written all around the dome and one of the sayings that sticks with me is it says that uh, a nation a nation is known by its authors mm. A nation is known by its authors. Mm -hmm. See, so that has a double meaning. How do you find out about your own nation? The one that you're a part of. See, we often teach that we don't know our own history. Well, that's not just ancient history that we don't know. We don't know what happened 20 years ago, 30 years ago, 40 years ago. We don't even know that recent history. Yes, sir. See, so a nation is known by its authors because it's the authors, the writers, the scribes that write down the events that took place. And that's how the history of the nation gets passed on. Yes, but also a nation is known by its authors because the authors are the storytellers. Yes, and they're telling the story of the nation to the rest of the world. So that the rest of the world has a proper impression of, of what the nation is actually all about. See, so that's where, in my opinion, we've fallen woefully short. That, that we don't write books. I mean, we're, we are writing more and more books. I mean, yes. Dr. Ava wrote books. The Dr. Wesley writes books. You know, people write books. But I'm saying, where is the definitive story of the nation of Islam? Yes, sir. Where is the true history, for example, of Malcolm X? Mm, mm. Yeah, Let's get yeah, into yeah. it. Yeah, who's going to write the true history of Malcolm X? Since everybody wants to be so interested in this loser, who, who, who's going who's gonna to write the chronicle of how, of, of his rise and his fall? Mm. And what were the motives and the causes of both his rise and his fall? Yes, sir. Since people like to study that kind of thing, now, actually, I think it's a waste of time by now. But again, scholars, they do waste a whole lot of time digging out details of this, that, and the other, because that's what scholars do. Yes, sir. But again, for the sake of history, see, that kind of work is important to be done. You know, so the story gets told the right way and not just told by our enemies. Because otherwise, you see, history is like this. History is told by the victors. That's right. Let me say that again. History is told by the victors. So then if we don't tell our own story, then it looks like somebody else won. And that ain't true. That ain't true. They didn't win. Look at them now over there in Ukraine. Are they winning? Go ahead, go ahead. That's right. No, they're losing. Look at the economy. Are they winning? No, they're losing. Well, then who are the winners? We're the winners, but we just don't tell nobody. <laughs> We just don't tell nobody. We're, our lips are sealed, like, like it's a secret. Like it's a secret that, that God came and visited us. Yes, sir. By name. See? See, look at Muslims, Brother Joshua. See, Muslims all over the world, they, they pray al-Fatiha. What does al-Fatiha, how does that go? It says, in the name of Allah, right? Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Starts. And that's all through the Holy Quran. 
Almost every chapter in the Holy Quran starts like that. Bismillah, in the name of Allah. But what's missing? What's missing? His name. The name. That's right. Well, who has the name of Allah? We got the name. That's right. But why do we hide it? In the name of Allah. The name of, see, see Allah is a title. See, see, when we have the true teaching of God, the knowledge of God, see, we understand that Allah is just a title. Yes, sir. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad even writes in uh, um, Our Savior Has Arrived. He, he says that every Muslim is an Allah. Mm. Every mm. Muslim is an Allah. Who is Allah? See, this is what convinced me to join the Nation of Islam. When I found out that Allah is the 4 billion, 400 million members of the original nation of the planet Earth, and that includes me. Yes, sir. That yes, includes sir. me. I'm a member of the 4 billion, 400 million members of the original nation, and that includes me. I am Allah, the black man of Asia. That includes me. Yes, sir. So when I say in the name of Allah, that could be me. Mm. But of course, we know it means the one that came in person, Master Farad Muhammad. Now, see, back in the day, prior to 75, see, we had uh, more reverence for that name than I see people having reverence for that name today. A lot of what people say about Master Farad Muhammad back in the day, that would have been considered blasphemy. Mm. That would have got that. That would have gotten a quick response from uh, the followers of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. Some of the things that people get away with now, saying about Master Farad Muhammad, they wouldn't have got away with that back then. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. See, we were fierce about that. See, because we were, um, see, we were cognizant and made aware of the value of the Ten Commandments. Mm. And one of the Ten Commandments was that you do not use the name of uh, the Lord God in vain. Yes, sir. All right. Well, we know who God is now. So we better watch our mouth. How we use that name. So we're not using it in vain. And since we got our simple Negro intellect, we might not even recognize that we're using his name in vain. So you better be careful. Mm. You better think five times before you speak, especially when you're speaking in the name of Master Farad Muhammad. Because we're not talking about some mystery God that's not present. He's yes, sir. Yes, in sir. The world. Wow. You see, so we were scared of Master Farad Muhammad. See, they're talking about the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. So we were scared of him. Because, you see, he might pop in at any moment. See, a lot of times people nowadays give you the impression they don't think Master Farad Muhammad could pop in at any moment. Mm, mm. Like he might not pop over for dinner. <laughs> Suppose he popped over for, for dinner. What would you feed him? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. See, look, look at look at what it says in the scripture there, where uh, Abraham, see, God popped in on him. See, they say Abraham was the friend of God. That's right. So if you if God is your friend, He might pop in on him. Yes, sir. Pop yes, in sir. on you. <laughs> I'm not saying you could pop in on him, <laughs> but He might pop. Suppose He dropped in for dinner. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I mean, right. I mean, I'm I'm saying it in a very realistic way, like if Master Farad Muhammad. See, 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 the believers say they still believe he's alive. See, that, that's what they say. Mm. But suppose he walked through the door. Suppose he walked through my door right now. Do I have anything in here that he would eat? Mm. Or that would be fit to give to him? Mm. You see, that, that's, that's the question that every believer should be asking. Would, would he actually enjoy macaroni and cheese? <laughs> 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 you know? <laughs> I mean, if, I mean, would we really serve him? Uh, would would, he, would we serve back to him a recipe of the bean pie? Mm. See, that's that's one of the things that convinced all of us to join the nation. See, when I first went to a mosque meeting and they served something called bean pie, I asked the sister lieutenant, "Wait a minute, what 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 what, what did you say this is?" She said, "This is a bean pie." I said, "What kind of beans?" So I, I thought it was green beans or something like that. <laughs> I didn't know. <laughs> <laughs> she said, no, navy beans, navy beans. I said, what, you mean the little pea shooter beans? She said, yeah, mm. the little pea shooters. Mm. I said, where did you learn how to do that? She said, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad taught us how to do, do this. I said, really? Mm. And then it was so good. I said, if the Honorable Elijah Muhammad can do this much with a little pea shooter bean, 
I'm sure he could do something with, with me then. He could do something with, with me because that's the supreme recipe. Yes, sir. And then we did research. See, we were college students. See, because we didn't actually believe what they said. <laughs> that, that nobody else had ever made a bean pie. We didn't believe that. Mm, mm. So we started researching. We started reaching, researching all over the world. And, you know, we couldn't find a recipe for bean pie nowhere. Mm, mm. So then we started saying, well, wait a minute. Wait a minute. So how could somebody come up with a new recipe that nobody else ever came up? It wasn't Italian. It wasn't Spanish. It wasn't Russian. It wasn't Chinese. It wasn't Japanese. Didn't nobody know nothing about bean pie till Master Farad Muhammad came. And then he made it better than anything. Let me tell you how good the bean pie was back then, brother. That pie was so good that it would, it would, it would cause fights to break out in the brotherhood. Mm, mm. <laughs> yeah, people would stop. They didn't want to share no more. <laughs> the brother that would give this shared off his back, he wouldn't give you a piece of that pie. Right <laughs> <it was> short. <laughs> well, one time we got in trouble with the captain because we were supposed to be out selling the papers, and we found out that they had a shipment of the Chicago bean pie in Indianapolis, mm. which was a hundred miles away. <laughs> yes, sir. Well, we saw a rain cloud in the sky, so we figured it was getting ready to rain. So instead mm. of selling papers, we went to Indianapolis and bought some bean pie. Mm. The captain didn't think too highly of that. <laughs> <laughs> no, that was early on. That was early on before we we were even registered. <laughs> yes, sir. Yes, sir. We were just trying Islam out at that time to okay. see if it was really what it was supposed to be. You see. Yeah. Yes, sir. But Dr. Lee, uh, and people are showing you love all across the country. I mean, literally sending you love and positive energy. But I have a question uh, because we have a lot of questions. Please let us know your questions and comments in the comments uh, in the comment section. But I wanted to ask you about you said that you didn't believe you were just questioning when when people come to us or ask. And we have you're saying that if we have the right spirit, we have we should question the teachings and the principles to make sure that we have a comprehensive knowledge. You're saying it's okay to oh, question. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. See, okay. yeah. See, okay. um, see, the way it used to be taught back then, um, the minister in the rostrum would say, try Islam. Mm. <laughs> try try Allah. <laughs> you know, like, like see, see, we have to understand Islam is a two-way street. Allah promises us in the Quran, he's going to try us. Right? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. He's going to try us to see if we're what? If we're true believers, right? Yes, if we're true yes, followers. If we will actually do uh, in obedience what God says that we should do. So God tries us because lip service is not enough. Okay, well, it's a two way street. The believer gets to try Allah mm. to see mm. if he's real. Mm. I mean, there's a whole lot. See, the Bible says it like this there's, there's God's many and Lord's many. Mm, mm. There's a whole lot of people out here uh, uh, masquerading as God. A whole lot of interpretations about God. Everybody claimed they know God. So it's just like in, in the Bible, you had the prophet e Elijah uh, in a contest with the Baal prophets. Mm. They claimed they claim Baal was God. Well, they, there's still people in the world today, brother, that claim Baal is God. Mm, mm, mm. there's pagans in the world they they believe in pagan gods yes sir yes sir what do you think all these different uh holidays are all about they're not worshiping the same god we worship in that's right and what were we into before we found the teachings or the teachings found us of the honorable elijah muhammad what were we into we were into a, a belief in some kind of god mm. you go ask the average negro on the street if he believes in god yeah he believes in god but you ask him what god mm. he can't tell you you see, so now we were we were informed that the actual personal identity of God at the present time in person is Master Farad Muhammad. So we were told to go out and try him and see if he really is God. Mm. Don't just don't take our word for it. Go out and try him. And that's what we used to do. We would go out and try Master Farad Muhammad to see if he could actually save us. Mm. Mm. Well, I'll give you a, I'll, I'll give you a story. I've told this story more than once. Yes, sir. This was before I even got my ex. And like I mentioned earlier, see, I used to I used to be the campus reefer man. 
<laughs> and one time, you see, the way back in those days, even nowadays, they legalized it and all kinds of stuff. So there's no shortage. There was no supply chain issues today. Yes, sir. But back then, see, you would you would you would get a load in, and then it would dry up, and you had customers beating on the door. So this uh, this before I came in the nation. Now, yes, sir. So one time, you know, to satisfy my customers, I had to I had to actually commit a robbery. Mm. So there was a drug deal going down somewhere, and so me and my partner we. We we stuck up the drug boys. <laughs> okay. Yeah, we stuck up. Well, I had to satisfy my customers. Mm, mm. And see, somebody had beat me. Mm. Somebody had already beat me. So you know how that goes. I had to beat somebody. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. See, that's what I was saying before. See, in that world, you you know, you're doing things that you shouldn't be doing. But you think you have to do it in order to get ahead. You so 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 there I had robbed somebody of their drugs, and then in the middle of that, I came in the nation. Mm. So now by the time the brother caught up to me that I had robbed, see, I had cut off my afro, I was in you know, a suit and tie, bow tie, had a, a a pile of papers under my arm. And next thing I know, I got a gun upside my head. Mm. And I looked, and it was him. <laughs> mm, mm, mm. He caught up with me. You yes, say, <laughs> you know, because I had robbed him. Mm. And the, the only thing I could say, I'm not in that anymore, man. I'm with Muhammad. Mm. And you know that man dropped the gun, and he looked at me. He said, "He said these are the words he said. He said, nigga." I didn't think there was anything that you could say to me that would keep me from killing you. He said, but you came up with it. <laughs> he said, but nigga, if you're jiving, you're going to see me again. Mm, mm. And so I reached in my pocket and I pulled out my notebook. And I said, let me take your name and address. <laughs> and I made him my paper customer. <laughs> yeah, his name was Billy in Dayton, Ohio. Yeah, mm. and uh, so Billy saw me every Saturday morning. I would knock on Billy's door. Here's your paper, man. I ain't jiving. I ain't jiving. You see, so that's why I'm stuck in the nation. See, that's why I'm stuck in the teachings. See, mm. you're talking about trying Master Farad Muhammad, yes, trying sir. the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. See, I wouldn't even be alive. See, I would have been a statistic. You know, young black man uh, shot in the back of the head, gangland style, found dead laying in an alley. You see, that, that, that would have been the story that would have been carried home to my mother. Mm. And she, we want, what, what happened? What happened to Mookie? Mm. Out there playing a game that he had no business playing. Here's a man with a righteous nature out there in the wicked world. You can't win. Yes, sir. Go visit the prisons. You're talking about ministers, what they should do. If you want to be a minister in the nation of Islam, you should be in the prison uh, uh, preaching to the prisoners. Mm, See, mm. those are the unsuccessful criminals that didn't get killed. So if I had not gotten killed, I'd have been one of the one of the unsuccessful criminals locked up behind bars. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. But who saved me from that fate? Who saved me from death? Master Farad Muhammad, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. I wouldn't need every breath that I've taken since the age of 20. I owe it to Master Farad Muhammad. I owe it to the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. You see, and I got to pay my debt. See, so that's how I feel about it. <laughs> so, so, so we tried the gods. See, like if the mosque was short on money or there was some problem, or like when I had to go to medical school and my car was broke down, I, I needed a new engine in my car. I mean, we would, we would literally pray to Master Farah Muhammad. That's the only time we would pray to Master Farah Muhammad by name. Mm. And then he would deliver. Mm. Mm. I got a new engine for my car. <laughs> you know, or, or whatever the mosque needed, we would get. You see? Now, let me just finish on this, you see, because it's more important than ever for us to try Master Farad Muhammad today. 
than it was back then because this devil has gone wild today. Yes, He's wilder today than he was back then. Yes, see, he was on his good behavior back then. Back then, see, uh, he was trying to pretend like he was civilized. Mm. But now you can look at this guy Zelensky over there in Ukraine and you can just see he's just a, a barbarian savage over there in Saudi Arabia among civilized people looking like some barbarian just cut, kept crawled out of a cave. Mm. You see, so in other words, what they, 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 they're showing their true nature now. You see, and they got these biological weapons. They got all this stuff going on, the 5G network, the artificial intelligence, you see. So we have arrived at the time that the Bible described as a time that if it were not for divine intervention, no flesh could be saved. Mm. See, well, we can see that staring us in the face. Our very extinction as a people, as a nation, is staring us right in the face. Yes, sir. The cloud of death, the cloud of doom is hovering close over our head. Now, some of us welcome doom, and that's okay with them. They don't mind going out with the world as it goes out. But there are some of us who actually have a vision of the future. Mm -hmm. You see, you see, everybody that came out of Egypt with Moses and Aaron, they didn't see the hereafter. Mm. Matter of fact, Moses didn't see the hereafter, did he? No, sir. Yeah, see, and a lot of the people that were never in Egypt, never in Egypt, they were born in the wilderness, mm. wandering in confused circles, sitting around campfires, telling stories. So you can tell they, they, they didn't know what they was doing. How, how could the, uh, the, the Hebrews <laughs> have been in Egypt and they telling all these campfire stories uh, that they wrote up into a Bible and they don't even mention the pyramids? Mm, mm. You know they wasn't in Egypt. Yes, they sir. didn't even mention the pyramids in the Bible. Ain't no mention of the pyramids in the Bible. So these people are just telling lies. That's what I'm saying. Yes, sir. So, so what we must understand is that that we are the chosen of God, not in the old sense. See, we're not talking about we're the chosen of Jehovah. Jehovah didn't choose us. Mm, mm. That was the name of another God at another time. Yes, sir. We weren't chosen by, uh, say, uh, Melchizedek. There was another God at another time. We're not the chosen people of Shiloh. Yes, sir. That was the name of another God at another time. That God ain't here no more. We are the chosen of the present God. Yes, sir. You see, so when people start out Fatiha or any other statement and they talk about Bismillah or in the name of Allah and they don't actually mention which God, which Allah they talking about, they could be talking about any one of us. Mm. But you don't need any one of us. <laughs> I can't help you. You mm. can't help me. Mm. The only one among us that can help us is Master Farad Muhammad. Mm. So then we should be asking in the name of Master Farad Muhammad. That's the name. Yes, sir. That's the magic name. That's the name of salvation by which you will be saved. Yes, sir. So you have people walking around talking about Jesus is the only name by which you're going to be saved. Yeah, back then. But then we know who Jesus is. We got the true history of Jesus. We don't fault those people for being confused about Jesus. Yes, sir. Because all they had to go on was the concocted King James version of the Bible. And it tells you right on the cover, it ain't nothing but a version. And then Master Farad Muhammad told us it's just a poison book. So how could you fault the Christians for being confused about the name of Jesus? Mm. They don't know that they were there in the same situation that I was in as a college student. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. That's why I was confused about God, because I had been raised in the church. <laughs> and I understood that was just a bunch of confusion. You see, but that's the same thing that you have going on to today. So we have to tell people who God is well, by name. Yes, sir. Otherwise, they'll be calling on dead prophets. They'll be calling on dead gods. See, Allah is eternal, but the person who is Allah is not eternal. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. You teach. See, the way they ran it down to me, you know, David Bachel ran it down to me. It's like the president of the United States is the title of a man. Yes, sir. 
but the person who is the president at any given time is not the same man. That's right. See, so Biden is president now. Obama used to be president. You know, George Washington once upon a time was president. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. See, so if we just say, well, in the name of the president, Mm. We're going to do so and so. Well, what president are you talking about? Mm. You might be disturbing George Washington in his grave. <laughs> so yes, if you're adding, so so now see at the present time, if you really want to get something done in the present time situation, mm. you would have to address your letter to Joe Biden mm. because he's the living. I guess he's alive, right? He's the, <laughs> <laughs> whatever. <laughs> Whatever that is, that's, yes, that's sir. who you would have to address it to. Yes, sir. It wouldn't make any sense for you to send a letter to Obama mm. just because he used to be president. Mm, mm, mm. So people praying in the name of Jehovah. Yeah, he used to be God. Uh -huh, mm. I understand. And it's good to remember him. Mm. We don't want to forget any of them. <laughs> you know, yes, but sir. who's the current one who replaced all of them? Allah Wakba. So you got to try God, see, if, yes, see if it works, see what you can get. We know what we got from the mystery God. We, we got nothing. <laughs> Excellent teachers, Dr. Lane, and people are showing you love all across the country. They, everybody's taking notes and showing love in the comments. Thank you. Thank you very much to Brother Roosevelt from Louisiana. Uh, always holding it down in the comments. Thank you, everyone who's watching. Thank you, Minister Aisha from Phoenix. Thank you, everyone who's just showing love in the comments right now. Thank you, Dr. Lane, Exodus. People are preaching. Yes, sir. God show. All praise to Allah. Thank you all for continuing to like, share, and subscribe to People's Podcast. All right. My next question is, we spoke of uh, a brother who my both my mother and my father speak very highly of, um, Minister Kareem, and how 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 important he, what his role was in you and your development in the nation, sir. Can you tell us how you all were connected? Oh, Minister Kareem. You mean uh, formerly Minister Linward X? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah, yeah. See, I met him when he was Minister Linward X, and he was the East Coast Regional Minister. And basically, he built up the whole East Coast from nothing. Mm. There wasn't nothing in New York, wasn't nothing in New Jersey. He was from Plain, or is from Plainfield, New Jersey, you know, but everything on the East Coast that started humming uh, in the early uh, rebuilding days of the Nation of Islam, you have to give the credit to where credit is due, Minister Linward. Now he wasn't by himself. He had a whole bunch of brothers and sisters uh, who were helping him. Like uh, the captain at that time, uh, Captain Gaddafi. Mm, mm, <laughs> yeah, mm. Captain Gaddafi. Yeah, that, he called himself Captain Gaddafi. Mm. And um, then I'm trying to remember the sister who was the, the secretary. And um, then of course, Brother Bert. Brother Bert was a school teacher. And Brother mm. Bert was interested in reviving uh, the University of Islam in New York. Mm. Um, now, I was there at Harlem Hospital. See, when the minister started rebuilding the nation of Islam in 1979, I heard about it uh, through uh, an interview that he had granted to the New York Amsterdam News. That, that was the newspaper in Harlem. Mm. And I remember one Friday, I got the paper. And I was in the hospital library and I read the interview. The minister said he was trying to rebuild the nation of Islam. Mm -hmm. Well, that excited me because I had never gone, I had really never gone along with Wallace. See, I never, I never, I, I, I actually, I thought I was a hypocrite because I couldn't understand the new teachings according to Wallace D. Muhammad. Mm -hmm. See, I thought mm -hmm. something was wrong with me, mm -hmm. you know? Uh, and so that's why I left, that's why I left the, the mosque under Wallace because I thought something was wrong with me. See, because he was he was supposed to be teaching the new teachings, the supreme wisdom, and it didn't make no sense to me. So I guess I, I was thinking, well, Allah just don't want me. Mm. See, so Allah don't make it make sense to me. So, and it really sounded like that old mystery God teaching anyhow. So, plus I was trying to learn surgery anyhow. So I didn't have no time for foolishness. So I had just drifted away. Uh, from 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 the mosque. So, um, but the uh, what they called the Bilalians. See, the followers of Wallace D. Muhammad. They called themselves at that time the Bilalians, and mm -hmm. they had the Bilalian news. And so, uh, most of the Muslims in New York that were at the hospital at Harlem Hospital, 
which was at 135th Street and Lenox Avenue. The mosque was at 116th Street and Lenox Avenue. You see, just mm -hmm. 20 blocks away. So um, all of the Muslims at the hospital had converted and they were Bilalians. Mm -hmm. And they were all putting pressure on me. They started having Juma prayer in the hospital, you know, and they was one want to know what's wrong with what's wrong with me, you know? And so eventually they just say, oh, he just Elijah's doctor. He just Elijah's doctor. You know, mm. you, you can't even talk to him. He he just Elijah's doctor. You mm. see, but back then, you see, you had to be careful because if you were actually identified openly as someone who still believed in the teachings of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, you see, that that was like a threatening situation to be in. And so so I kept my mouth shut. But when I saw the interview that the minister had granted that he was rebuilding the nation, the first thing I did was uh, I got my checkbook and I wrote him a check for $200 mm -hmm. and uh, dropped it in the mailbox in front of the, the, the uh, in front of Harlem Hospital. And as soon as I dropped it in the mailbox, I said, oh no, it's a setup, <laughs> it's a setup. <laughs> It's the FBI again. <laughs> and they just got me. They just got me. <laughs> I just, now they're going to know I'm with the messenger. <laughs> so I was, I was on pins and needles for a while, you know. But then shortly after that, uh, in 1980, uh, it was actually May the 18th, 1980. This was the only time I played hooky uh, from the hospital. Because by this time I was chief resident, mm. but I, I played hooky. I told I told my junior re resident, I said, I'm going to disappear for a few hours. See, he thought I had a girlfriend somewhere, uh, but but the minister had come to town and mm. uh, was at City College. This was May the 18th, 1980. This was mm. the same day that Mount St. Helens erupted, you know, in the northwest corner. You see? And so this was the first time that I had laid eyes on Minister Farrakhan since the fall of the nation. Mm. And there he was at uh, City College, and he gave a beautiful lecture. And guess who else was there and spoke on the program? Mm. Brother Khalid. Mm. Now, at that time, he was called Brother Rashadin. Mm. Brother Rashadin, you see? Uh, but And that's the first time I met, uh, met him, Brother Khalid, mm. Ra mm. Rashadin at the time. You see, and, and so... Um, that's when I hooked up with the minister. And, I, and when, when I heard him teach once again the correct teachings of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, then I felt vindicated mm. that, you know, that I wasn't wrong you know, for walking away from Wallace and all the rest of that. Because I, I never claimed to be no Orthodox Muslim. Mm. See, I always said, I'm a Black Muslim. Mm. You know what that means? See, I'm a Black Muslim. I ain't like that. I don't call me no Sunni. Don't call me no Shia. No, I ain't trying to be none of that. I ain't, I ain't from Pakistan. I'm, I'm not from none of that. See, that, that's what got Malcolm killed. Mm. See, me messing around with the Muslim Brotherhood. And he thought those were sincere Muslims. They weren't sincere Muslims. The Muslim Brotherhood, I know that sounds like a nice title. See, all the Muslims that came around Malcolm, uh, you know, when he got tricked by Wallace. See, people don't like to tell that part of the story. See, see when, when they say, uh, did, did the nation of Islam kill Malcolm? And we like to say, no. Well, wait a minute, tell the whole story. The murder, the setup and murder of Malcolm X was both an inside and outside job. Mm. Just tell the truth. Who set Malcolm X up? It was from the family of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. Mm. Wallace D. Muhammad was an FBI agent mm. from, the own, from the FBI's own documents. He was the one that spread all of the slander against his father. He was the one uh, that corrupted Malcolm's faith in the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. He was the one that was behind all of that, working for the FBI. And so then when, when uh, he set Malcolm up and, and then Malcolm's out there by himself, then he gets surrounded by all of these so-called Orthodox Muslims that were members of the Muslim Brotherhood. Well, if I say Muslim Brotherhood, maybe people don't know what I'm talking about. But if I said, um, if I said the Freemasons, if I said the Shriners, 
If I said the Illuminati, you know what I'm talking about. You see, if, if I said the deep state, you know what I'm talking about. If I said B'nai B'rith, you know what I'm talking about. If I said the Knights Templar, you know what I'm talking about. So when I say the Muslim Brotherhood, hey, that's what I'm talking about. I'm talking about those Jews that are not Jews, but are of the synagogue of Satan. I'm talking about those Christians who are not Christians, but are of the church of Satan. I'm talking about those Muslims who are not Muslims, but they are of the mosque of Satan. Mm -hmm. So that's who surrounded Malcolm, an FBI informant who just happened to be the blood son of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad and all of these uh, Illuminati Muslims. And these were the same Muslims. You can check it out. These Muslim Brotherhood from Egypt. They were led by a sheikh. I can't recall his name offhand. But they were the they were the Muslim regiments for not Adolf Hitler. Mm. So what are we talking about? We're talking about Nazi Muslims. Mm. So these are the people that surrounded Malcolm and led him astray. And so then by the time he got his thoughts together and began to understand that he had been led down the primrose path, well, then they they murdered him. And guess who was back on the the, the rostrum at Savior's Day the very next day, asking for forgiveness from the Honorable Elijah Muhammad and the Nation of Islam, Wallace D. Muhammad, mm. after he set his brother up for murder. Mm. Well, did the Honorable Elijah Muhammad accept him back? It's on tape. You can go listen, listen to it for yourself. He, he, he said, if they accept you back, I accept you back. Mm. That ain't no exactly a warm welcome. That ain't exactly the prodigal son coming home uh, to a loving father. You see, but that, so, so if you wanna talk about the murder of Malcolm X, just tell the truth. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad said that the nation of Islam is honeycombed with hypocrites, then and now. So when one of these hypocrites in the name of Allah, commit some heinous act, then we get smeared with it. Well, until we clean out these uh, uh, this honey nest of hypocrites, we will continue to get smeared with it until we tell our own story and tell the truth about it and about everybody involved in it, we will continue to get smeared with it because our only salvation is to tell the truth. What's wrong with telling the truth about it? Oh, praise the Lord. Excellent teaching. <laughs> yes, sir. And people are in the comments are going uh, very supportive of you and saying teach. Praise be to Allah, honeycomb. Um, uh, excellent. One love. Still we rise. Absolutely. People are saying cause and effects. Mm, everybody's showing love. Mm, and then Minister Mills said writing characters. People just showing love. Okay, yes, sir. But okay, but I wanted to I wanted to get back to the point about Minister Kareem and your and his suggestion. I wanted to oh, oh, you know, I actually I, I, I actually lost my way. <laughs> But no, so so I told you how I first got in the ministry. Yes, sir. And so uh, when when I came to to New York to begin my surgical residency, um, I was I, I wasn't active in the ministry at all. And Wallace took over, and um, I left the mosque on the Sunday that um, um, they used to have what they call these telephone hookups from Chicago. Mm. And that was the Sunday that I'm sitting there with the FOI and he announced that he was changing the name of mosque number seven to Malcolm Shabazz Masjid. Mm. And, a, and a chill went up and down my spine. And I said, whoa, I'm sitting up in a mosque named for a hypocrite to the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. Mm. Mm -hmm. I, I, was, I was nervous at that point. So then, now you know how the brothers do uh, when the brothers are in the mosque and they're sitting in a row and a brother gets up to use the restroom or whatever, then the brothers shift down, right? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay, so the brother sitting next to me, he got up for some reason. And then the brother next to him, he shifted down next to me. And you know how it goes. When the brother shifts down next to you, then you turn to your brother, you shake your brother's hand like that, right? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So I turned to shake my brother's hand. I'm looking in the face of a blue-eyed devil. Mm. I'm, I'm what? So that's the last. See, see, in other words, so that's the last time I went to the mosque. 
because that was not the mosque anymore. That was not the nation of Islam that I had joined. And we should stop saying the fall of the nation like the nation stumbled and fell down. No, it was taken over. It was taken down by an FBI informant. Okay, that's, that's the truth. Now, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad said in 1972 to all of his ministers all over the nation, he said, I am going away. I will be gone for approximately three years. I am going away to get the new teachings. While I am gone, the world will say and believe that I am dead, but I will not be dead. I am going away to get the new teachings. See, that was broadcast all over the nation in 1972, mm. uh, around the time of the theology of time. So all of us knew that when we heard the announcement in 1975, on February the 25th, that the Honorable Elijah Muhammad had passed away, none of us believed it. Mm. Because it was exactly what he said. The world will say that I am dead and believe that I am dead, mm. but I will not be dead. I am going away to get the new teachings. So when we heard that teaching, we did not believe it. Even though we heard it, we didn't believe it. Mm. And we knew that in the absence of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, that Minister Farrakhan was going to be our leader. Mm. Everybody knew that. That had been publicly announced. He had been placed in the seat of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. And if we mm. all know that story. I don't yes, have sir. To it. You see, so that was that was where we were at that moment. And then the takedown occurred. So I wouldn't say the nation fell, the nation was taken down, but I would say that people like me fell. I fell. Mm, mm, mm. I was an assistant minister over a major mosque. And I wasn't no joke, brother. Yes, sir. Yes, I sir. Wasn't no joke. Yes, sir. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> I took a tumble, and everybody took a tumble. And the breath of fresh air was when the minister announced that he was rebuilding the nation. And that was approximately three years after the announcement of the death of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. So from my point of view, oh, that's exactly what we were told. I will be gone approximately three years. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And so when the minister announced he was rebuilding, oh, that's the Honorable Elijah Muhammad speaking uh, to us again through his number one minister that we always expected would be the one. Mm, mm. We didn't have no knowledge. Look, let me tell you how obscure Wallace D. Muhammad was in the nation. I was an assistant over a major mosque. And when they announced that Wallace D. Muhammad was the Supreme Minister, I had to ask Minister Henry, the other assistant minister, who's Wallace D. Muhammad? Mm, mm. I had been in the nation seven years. I had never heard his name, mm. much less know anything about him. And Minister Henry didn't know anything about him. Mm. Only thing he said, well, they say he's spiritual. <laughs> <laughs> and now, this, now this, this cockeyed man is now the head of the nation of Islam. Mm. You see, so I'm just saying that that was the devastation of that period of time. That's what I'm describing. I'm describing the psychological devastation and destruction. And I'm mentioning that, not, not just as it involves me, and I haven't forgotten your question. Yes, sir, yes, sir. But I want you to know, and I want everybody to know, there were thousands, perhaps tens of thousands of Muslims that did not make it. 
their hearts were broken and they died of broken hearts. Mm. Thousands of them. So sometimes I've heard the question in the rebuilding years, uh, where, where, where's, where's the Muslims from prior to 75? Don't you realize the majority of them died? What the hell, what the hell do you think took place? There was psychological torture that was deadly for people because the, the nation was all that they ever had. And then somebody disrupted, as they say in Scientology, their stable data. And they lost it. So when I, when I was in medical school in Cleveland, I remember that I did my psychiatric, psychiatry rotation, going through the this general psychiatric hospital ward. I'm walking from one end of the ward to the other. And before I got from one end of the psych ward to the other, let's see, I met, I'm, the first person I met was uh, Master Farad Muhammad. Mm. I met two or three Jesus Christ. Mm. And right at the last door, right by the door, it was the Holy Ghost. Mm. Mm. These were people who were driven mad by the destruction of the nation. Mm. They just couldn't take it. So when we say the nation fell, it didn't fail. It was taken down in a very vicious manner that was deadly to thousands and thousands of the righteous Muslims that had built the nation. And that was the nature of the operation. And the purpose of the operation was to get rid of those worthy servants of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad who first built the nation. Mm -hmm. so that they, it could never be rebuilt again. So that's the psychological state that I'm coming out of when Minister Linward or Minister Kareem yes, sir. is yes, helping sir. Minister Farrakhan to rebuild the nation. Yes, sir. And so uh, I was helping uh, in New York as much as I could. Do you know, brother, the, do you know that I was the paper captain in New York? No, sir, I do not know uh, the that. Minister Linward or uh, Minister K Kareem. I was the paper captain. Yeah, mm. and, we, and we, would, we led the nation in the sale of the first editions of the Final Call newspaper. Yeah, people, people look at me as a minister. Hey, I was a captain too. Mm, go ahead, <laughs> yes, sir, yes, sir. <laughs> so long story short, um, Minister Linward used to allow me to open up. He found out that I used to be an assistant minister, so he wasn't proud. He, he needed all the help he could get, you know, so he used to let me open up for him. And then sometimes he would send me over to the Bronx and um, different places in New York. We were over in Brooklyn. We used to have study groups. Uh, what's that? Uh, Eastern Parkway. Mm, mm. Uh, there's a big... Uh, McDonald's that used to be there. I don't know if it's still there. We used to have study groups in the McDonald's, you know? Mm, mm. I mean, that's how we started out, you know? We used well. to be in dance halls and clubs with the, you know, beer soap carpet, you know, that smelled in the air. Yes, sir, yes, but, sir. But that's how we came up in New York. And I was doing the best I can as a young doctor trying to establish myself, but at the same time trying to help the minister to rebuild the nation through Minister Kareem. Mm. And so long story short, uh, he recommended me to Minister Farrakhan. Mm. And so uh, the minister came to New York for an event. And unfortunately, he didn't have time to meet with me. Um, and so he, well, he did briefly. And he said, but I, we don't have time for a meeting. But I'm on my way to Cleveland to speak somewhere in Cleveland the next day. Could you come with me? Mm. I said, oh, yeah, of course. Uh, I, <laughs> so I went to Cleveland with him for a Sunday event. And after the event at, in the hotel, he came right to the point. You know, mm. he, he told me the brother Kareem had uh, spoken highly of me and, and he wanted to know, would I help him uh, as a minister in Washington, D.C.? Mm. And I said, of course, <laughs> of course, without really knowing what I was getting into, you know, but of course, of course, of course. So that's that's that story. So it happened in Cleveland where I went to school and where I was once uh, an assistant minister. Oh, praise due to a lot. Yes, sir. excellent teaching. Thank you so much, Dr. Liam. And thank you, everybody who's watching. 
for letting for giving us this breakdown of primary source, firsthand witness bearing and experience. Man, this is powerful to me as a historian. I'm I'm learning, and I'm sure that everyone else is learning as well as we hear what it was like. Okay, so now you go to Washington D.C. Did you know what you would be once you got there? When when did it become real to you? Um, the reality of you know you being in the nation's capital, saying you know teaching the the most honorable Elijah Muhammad's teaching. Like, when did that become real to you? Um, well, I don't say, I, I, well, I would say it became very real to me when the hypocrites rose up in the study group. Mm. See, I, let's see, I came to Washington, that, we're talking about 1981. And then I physically moved to Washington in 1982 in April. And uh, we were building study groups. Uh, we had Brother Jabril's study guides and Brother Jackie, uh, the, Brother Donald was my secretary, Brother Wally was my captain, the, the final call editor, he was yes, my sir. captain. Yes, sir. When I moved to Washington, DC, the minister had called him to Chicago my wife and I moved into Brother Wally's apartment. Mm. And uh, so it didn't really become real to me what it meant to be a, a minister until there was actually an uprising of hypocrites <laughs> in the study group. Mm. See, they didn't, some of them didn't like me. See, they didn't like the fact that I was an educated man. They didn't like the fact that I was a surgeon. Uh, some of them said I was cold-blooded. They, they called me cold-blooded. Well, I mean, you think about the, the attitude that you have to have to be a surgeon. You know, some, you might look at it like it's cold-blooded. Yeah, you, I, I will cut you, you know, without blinking an eye. So if you want to call that cold-blooded, well, I think you just misunderstand the nature of what you're looking at, you know, but, but there were people like that. You know, they, they, they thought, you, you know, you had some people, brother, in the nation, they thought that the nation was a bunch of gangsters, you see. And so there was one one brother here in D.C., you know, he wanted to give me a black limousine and, and have me riding around, you know, like I was the godfather of Washington, D.C. And I disappointed him because I wasn't like that at all. And so it became real to me when uh, he and some others they rose up against me to overthrow me, to get rid of me. Mm. And I called the minister, I was, I was frightened, I was in shock. I, I said, they, they rising up brother minister. And uh, he, he said, oh brother, he said the hypocrites are like this. He said, they just like big waves out there in the ocean. And when you look out there in the ocean, you see them big giant waves and here they come crashing in the shore. He said, but by the time they get to shore, they just break up into little bubbles, you know. Mm, and, mm, 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 mm. and sure enough, you know what happened? You know what happened, brother? That brother uh, who thought I wasn't gangster enough, um, he called me up and told me that he had something made for me. He, had, he was going to do something to me. <laughs> And I called, I called my captain. This, by, by this time, I had another captain. And I, I told him what the brother had said, you know, and so there was a security threat. He'd really threatened my life. Mm. So the next day, 24 hours later, the captain called me on the phone, said, Brother Minister, turn on the news, channel whatever, channel four, whatever it was. And there was a police uh, siege of an apartment building. They said a man was holding his wife hostage. Mm. They got the hostage out and then they assaulted the apartment, broke down the door and they found a man hanging by his neck mm. in a black suit with a white shirt on and a red bow tie. Mm. And the man was the man that had just threatened me the day before. Mm. 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 See, that, 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 that's when it got serious to me, brother Joshua. <laughs> I said, you mean Allah will kill these people? That, that's when I said, I better watch my step. I better watch what I say. Mm, mm, mm. Because Allah is so serious about this thing that, see, I really didn't hardly even take that man's threat all that seriously. 
but Allah did. Allah Akbar. See, so that's so so that's when I realized, oh no, 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 this is a very serious position, or this is a very serious responsibility, you know, that has very dire consequences. You know, and I was looking at myself, maybe I should have been more gangster, you know. <laughs> I mean, I'm trying trying to get somebody killed just because I'm not gangster enough. You know, but I'm, but I'm just saying, so, so see, that brings a level of seriousness to it. Yes, because right. wh what are we taught? Wh what are we taught mostly in religion? Whether you're Christian, whether you're Muslim, whether you're Jewish, whatever faith you are, one of the primary teachings of every religious faith is uh, you're supposed to be humble, right? Be humble, be humble. Don't bow your head. Don't be falsely proud, you know? So we never think too much of ourselves. That's we right. We're taught to be, and we shouldn't. We really shouldn't, because you ain't that much. You know, I don't care who you think you are. You ain't that much. You ain't that much. But see, the equation changes when God chooses you. Allah Akbar. See, it ain't so much that you so much, but God got plans for you. <laughs> yes, sir. Yes, sir. You don't have no plans for yourself, <laughs> but God got plans for you. And you don't know who you are. You don't know what you're getting ready to do. You don't know what life holds in store for you. Look, man, God came and made a promise to us. God made a promise to us. Now, do you think he gonna let some hypocrite uh, take you out of his promise? Come on, come on. Oh, no. You think he gonna let some devil take you out of his promise that he yes, promised sir. you? Oh, no. They said that if God be for you, no one can be against you. Even That's the right. devil, he, he ain't that big. He ain't that big. He ain't that big. Neither are hypocrites. They not that big. See, so now I'm not saying I'm big or that, that any of us are all that big, but God is big. That's why we say Allah U Akbar. That's right. That's right. Now, see, we mistranslate it most of the time. What I'm told by people who really speak Arabic, that's not me. But what I'm told is um, it doesn't mean Allah is necessarily the greatest. It means that, but it means like a sense like, like whatever you can name, Allah is greater than that. Mm -hmm. Whatever you can think of, Allah is greater than that. Whatever you think Allah is, no, 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 it's, it's beyond that. You can't even conceive of what that is. So whatever you can come up with, Allah is greater than that. That's why we say Allah Akbar. Yes, sir. So now since we know who Allah is by name, see, so when that brother threat, threatened me, who did I call him? Jesus? Mm. <laughs> no. Mm. <laughs> oh, Master Farah Muhammad. <laughs> you better come save me. <laughs> Yeah, 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 and then and then that's that's what happened. See, but but believe me, I didn't tell I didn't tell Allah to kill that brother. I didn't. Mm -hmm. Beautiful, yes, sir. And on that powerful note, Dr. Aline, uh, once again, we're gonna ask you, put you know, put some pressure on you. We got to get you to come back again because I'm gonna. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be glad to. I'll be glad. Yes, to. There's no pressure. No, be no pressure. Because we we want to we want to uh, chronicle you know from the DC like right. During this time period and moving forward and and come to present time as well because people you have such a strong following uh people sharing your you know through text messages or online people speak very highly of you and i want to assure you dr Eileen, that not only myself my family and the viewing audience of the people's podcast but people all over the world uh thank you for your sacrifice i know i know you like the sacrifice for your, I know, for your there work. no sacrifice i'm i guess yes sir. I'm, 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 I'm not an example of sacrifice. See, that's yes, Jesus sir. hanging on the cross with blood yes, sir, running yes, down. Sir. I ain't no example like that. No, yes, I'm sir. an example of blessing. See, I'm, I'm, what hap I'm, I'm an example of what happens to somebody when they actually believe in Master Farad Muhammad. So I'm, I'm a blessed man. I'm not, I'm not some crucified man sacrificing my life blood. No, everything that's happened to me since I've been in the nation is good. I ain't yes, got nothing. Sir. When uh, what do I have to complain about? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Ain't nobody doing nothing to me. That's working. They trying to do stuff. It don't work. Yes, sir. It never did work. Yes, sir. <laughs> so, I ain't sorry. so please, no, don't don't confuse. Yes, sir. Well, that's me. We thank you for don't, your don't blessings. Don't confuse me with them sacrificial people. I ain't like yes, that. Yes, sir. Well, we thank you for your blessings. We thank you for all the work that you put into the nation. Thank your family, and I'm I'm just inspired that I get to have the honor of interviewing you and chronicling this put on YouTube. And I look forward to when I come to DC, inshallah, meeting you in person, or speaking, not meeting you, but speaking to you in person to hear some more stories off the off the record of this. Uh, <laughs>
of the great work and the uh man just the this has been a powerful interview i want to thank everybody who's watching people in the comments are showing love all across the country uh minister jamil says we uh we love you and we thank you doc and um, thank you, Dr. Aline. People in the comments, uh, Allah Wakba, Allah Wakba, teach, teach, Allah Wakba. Dear God, love it. Praise be to Allah. All right. Well, this is Joshua Leonard Muhammad signing off for the People's Podcast. Thank you all for watching. Assalamu alaikum, sir. <laughs> yes, sir. Boom.